Right, thank you. Um, what I hope to try and do in uh, 15 minutes is try and change at least one aspect of your perception um, of the Iron Age, which is no pressure. Um, arguably the first person to try and categorise and phase and describe British prehistory was Geoffrey of Monmouth, uh, writing in the early 1130s AD. Um, and he put it down in the Historia Regum Britanniae, the history of the kings of Britain. Now, we don't know really very much about Geoffrey. Um, there was some dispute whether his name was really Geoffrey uh, and whether or not he actually came from Monmouth. We know <laughs> even less about his sources because he claims that he was merely translating an old book that was given to him that was written in the British tongue. Now, he's, that's about as unspecific as you can get. Um, so we don't really know anything about these sources at all, but they've had a huge impact on art, on culture, on literature. Um, so for characters like King Lear, uh, Cymbeline, Old King Cole and so on, they received their first outing in literature thanks to Geoffrey of Monmouth. And of course, it's also thanks to him that we get our, our first understanding of King Arthur because Geoffrey of Monmouth describes his life in some detail from the moment of his conception right the way through to his sort of mortal wounding um, at the Battle of Camelot. I won't go into King Arthur today, sadly. However, um, I suppose he's, there's been a negative criticism surrounding Geoffrey, which began within about seven decades of, of uh, the, the, the first sort of appearance of the Historia Regum Britanniae. This is uh, William of Newburgh, who said in a, quite a, a damning review, it is quite clear that everything this man wrote was made up, partly by himself, partly by others, either from an inordinate love of lying or for the sake of pleasing the Britons. Uh, which is about as bad a review. I've had some bad reviews. That's, that's <laughs> fairly bad. Peer review system. Yeah, indeed. Um, and, and that's the sort of, that uh, view has accelerated to the present day. I don't think you'll find any serious, certainly archaeological or historical scholar who will look at Geoffrey Monmouth and take any of it as being even vaguely factual. So we get, uh, this is from 1982, Geoffrey Ash. Monmouth is an entertaining and memorable companion so long as one never believes anything he says. And you can see that when, I suppose at face value, when you first look at uh, what Geoffrey of Monmouth is saying in the Historia Regum Britanniae, we have uh, a list of kings and queens, a list of monarchs who are descended from the Trojans. So there's this great sort of Trojan uh, diaspora, is, is a, a, a migration from the sack of Troy. Of course, we know Aeneas um, landing in Italy and founding the Roman race. What Geoffrey of Monmouth is saying is there is a series of descendants from Aeneas who then go forward to find the real promised land, which is Britain. So we get a list of kings starting with Brutus the first, Brutus, Locrinus, Gwendolyn, Madden, Mempricius, Edracus, Brutus the second, and so on. That's just a few of them. For most, we just get a series of years reigned, uh, a very brief description. Some we get rather expanded detail, like Lear obviously gets a, a huge amount of, of page coverage, as does the, the first Brutus, but really not an awful lot of <coughs> detail. But there we have Brutus arriving um, at Britain with a, a, a series of ships. Britain, of course, populated by a land of mythical giants. But of course, when we actually look at this, I mean, a lot of people treat this particular story as completely fantastical, a piece of Anglo-Norman or, or Brito-Norman propaganda, an obscene bit of, sort of nationalism, trying to promote the Britons as having this great bloodline going back to the Trojan race. But it doesn't begin with Geoffrey of Monmouth. What most people miss is that way back into the 4th century AD, we have a historian like Ammianus Marcellinus, who is saying with regard to tribes in Gaul and Germany, some maintain after the destruction of Troy, a few Trojans fleeing from the Greeks who were then scattered over the whole world occupied these districts which at that time had no inhabitants at all. Back to the first century AD, Lucan, the, when talking about the Arvenii, also regards the Adui, they dared to invent they were brothers to Latium from the blood of the Trojan people. Even Caesar himself talks about the Adui as being blood brothers. So there is this sense, going right there back to the first century BC, that some tribes in Gaul, in Germany, and arguably in Britain too, wanted to be so Roman, they were linking themselves right back to the Roman creation myth of Aeneas 
and the Trojans. So it could be, and this is what really started our project off, was to think, well, maybe there are elements of truth, truth within Geoffrey of Monmouth, um, and we shouldn't necessarily just reject it out of hand. And if you're going to, I won't go through all the detail, but if we're going to pick a particular historical event where we can compare things as they happen, where there is a, I won't say objective, but there is a, another account which we can relate to what's going on in, inside Geoffrey of Monmouth's text, the best starting point is Julius Caesar, because arguably these are the first sort of uh, major historical events in Britain. 55 and 54 BC, Caesar invades Britain. In the campaign of 54 BC, and Caesar, of course, is ridiculously vague on geographical detail. He only really describes the River Thames in any detail. He's very vague about places and hill forts and, and Oppida and, and, and so on. But we can construct a campaign like this. The Romans coming across, landing somewhere in Kent, moving across eventually over the Thames and attacking a native British centre just to the north of St Albans. And Caesar in 54 BC, again I won't go through all the detail of it, but he describes a specific battle 12 miles from the shore whereby the Britons suddenly swooped down from all sides, pressing their attack right up to the standards of the legions. The legionaries drove them off with a strong counter-attack and a great many were killed. And in this account of 54 BC, there are three key protagonists. Unsurprisingly, Julius Caesar is the hero. He's writing this account, therefore he is um, the great Roman super being. Cassivellaunus, or Cassivellaunus as we tend to refer to him today, is the leader of the British resistance. He's the bad guy. He's the one who's uh, leading a, a series of uh, wars <coughs> against his immediate neighbours. He's an aggressor. And there's Mandubratius, or Mandubracius, who's a prince of the Trinabantes tribe, who is pretty much, he's a quisling. He sides with the Romans, he provides tactical information, he does not, he wants Caesar to defeat Cassibolornus, his enemy, and protect his tribe. Now when we look at Geoffrey of Monmouth, we get the account of 54 BC, Cassibolornus marched to meet them with the whole of his force. Now of course this is written from a British perspective, therefore we are seeing it through their eyes in Geoffrey's account. He reached the town of Dorabellum, which is handy because that's a geographical place name of the sort Caesar doesn't give us. With him was Bellinus, the commander-in-chief of his army, Androgius, Duke of Trinovantum, Tenvantius, Duke of Cornobia, and the, who were the two nephews of Cassibolornus. Then, and one of the great things if you do sit down and read Geoffrey of Monmouth, it's not a, an easy read, I'll give you, but you can spot plagiarism. What we would define today as plagiarism really clearly. There are king lists, dynastic lists, there are epic poems, there are segments which clearly there's a change in style, a change in focus, a, ch a change in diction. All the things we're trained as academics to spot um, in uh, assignments where you can see things have been cut and pasted. I'm not, I mean, anyone here will do such a, a thing, obviously. But this is one such instance. We get a, a, a massive diversion into sort of epic territory. Two armies drawn up in battle array. The Britons engage the enemy in hand-to-hand -hand combat, matching javelin with javelin, sword thrust with sword thrust. On both sides, the wounded fell in heaps, with the weapons of war sticking in their entrails. The earth was drenched with the blood of the dying, as when a sudden southwest wind drives back the ebbing tide. I ask you to keep that picture in your mind for the moment. So in this account, we've got three protagonists, Julius Caesar, Ilkesar, who's the Roman invader, the bad guy, Cassibolornus, who's their leader of the resistance, the hero, and Androgius, who we can equate with Mandubracius, it's a garbling of that name, who is the Duke of London, who's a relatively minor character. Now, what we find a couple of pages on is the invasion of 54 BC again. In fact, if you look at Geoffrey, you get 54 BC invasion, then the 55 BC, then 54 again. And the reason you get it replicated, duplicated, is because Geoffrey evidently didn't realise he was looking at the same account, or looking at the account of the same invasion, but written from a different perspective. Therefore, details have changed, the nature of combat has changed, and the hero of the story has changed as well. So this second account of 54 BC... Cassibolornus was beginning to besiege Trinovantum, which Geoffrey equates with London, so Troia Nova, New Troy, London, uh, and was already sacking the villas and the outskirts of the city when he heard of the arrival of Caesar, of Ilkassar. He abandoned the siege and hurried to meet the emperor as he marched to a valley near Duraburnia. It was Dorabellum last time, it's Duraburnia here, it's both garbling of the same place. 
He saw there the Roman army busy, busy pitching its camp and putting up its tents. Now, critically, in this version, Androgius, the Duke of London, is on the Roman side. He himself lay hid with 5,000 armed men in a certain forest glade which they had chosen, ready to run to Caesar's help and to make a sudden unexpected charge against Cassibelaunus and his companies. So here we've got not just providing tactical information, but serious military assistance, aiding Caesar, aiding the Romans against another Briton. Then we get divergence into another epic poem. When the two sides came together in this way, they immediately started hurling death-dealing weapons at each other, exchanging equally mortal blows with their swords. The companies of men charged each other, much blood was shed. On both sides, the wounded fell to the ground, just as autumn leaves dropped from the trees. Three protagonists. Caesar is the great warrior. He's not a bad guy in this. He's, he's, a, he's a great warrior. Cassibelaunus is a tyrant, a bad guy. He's attacking British settlements before Caesar arrives. And Androgius, the Duke of London, is a hero. <clears throat> So in these three versions, version one written by Caesar, battle 12 miles from the coast, Caesar's victorious. The second version with Geoffrey, the battle of Dorabellum, Cassibelaunus is victorious, hurling Caesar back into the sea. Version three, the battle of Duraburnia, Caesar is victorious, but only with Androgius's help. Version one is Caesar's perspective, version two is Cassibelaunus's, version three is Mandibrachius. Now, Geoffrey didn't realise we were looking at the same account from two different perspectives, as he integrated them into his text. And knowing that helps us to explain some of the rather curious titles. Duke of Cornwall, Duke of London, King of Wales crops up time and time again. Cornubia, Trinovantum, Cambria. And that gives us a great geographical spread across southern Britain. Of course, when we actually look at these characters from Geoffrey of Monmouth and the archaeological evidence for them, Tenvantius <coughs> is Tascivanus. Tascivanus is not king of Cornwall, he's king of the Catabalorni, Catabalornia. Dun Valo Molmutius, king of Cornubia, Trinovantum and Cambria. Dubno Valornus, king of Catabalorni, Trinovantes and the Cantiaci. Rud Hud Hudibras, fantastic name, <laughs> king of Cornobia and Trinovantum, Adelamarus, king of the Catabalorni and the Trinovantes. It's not Trinovantum, Cambria, Cornubia, it's the Trinovantes, Catabalorni, Cantiaki. It's that area that all these stories are being generated from. And what Geoffrey's doing is putting it through his medieval mindset, names that make no sense or have been irrevocably garbled, and spreading it from Cornwall, Wales and London. That's not the original. So when we know that, we can see Brutus is arriving to form not London, but the Trinovantes. This is part of their origin myth, linking them back with the Trojans. And what is also missed is in that story, we get Quirinius, who is a great warrior, arguably better than Brutus. He's got his own subset of Trojans who meets up with Brutus en route to Britain, founds a kingdom which most, or Geoffrey included, thought was Cornwall. It's not, it's the Catavalorni. So you've got two tribes, two foundation myths, both linking directly to Rome, both saying that these are descended from the same blood <coughs> heritage as the Roman people, the Trojans. The Historia, therefore, as one example I've given you, but there are many others, is not a story set down in chronological order. It comprises multiple related and unrelated tales, most of which date back to the first century BC. What Geoffrey of Monmouth's done has wove these all together to form a single grand narrative, appreciating we've got the Trojans, that's a big problem, because they arrived quite early on, and to match from Brutus up to the arrival of Caesar, he's taken all these first century monarchs and spread them through, sometimes repeating them time and time again, but essentially it's the Kent, Hertfordshire, Essex area. Um, if you want more of that, you can either buy me a drink later, um, or you can buy that. That's the first book coming out from the project in March. Um, suffice just to point out, spoiler alert, there is no King Arthur. Um, he does not exist. He's a composite character drawn from lots of first century BC individuals. And I'll just finish on this. Trinovantum when we do get a reference to the town, of course, it's not London, it's not New Troy, it's Colchester, Camilla Duna. And so when Geoffrey has statements like this, Cassibelaunus, 
elevated with joy for the second victory, getting rid of Caesar, summoned all the nobility of Britain and their wives to Trinovantum in order to perform solemn sacrifices to the gods who'd given them their victory over so great a commander. Accordingly, they all appeared and prepared a variety of sacrifices for which there was a great slaughter of cattle. At this solemnity, they offered 40,000 cows, 100,000 sheep, fowls of every single kind without number, 30,000 wild beasts of several kinds. As soon as they performed these solemn honours to their gods, they feasted themselves on the remainder, as was usual at such sacrifices, and spent the rest of the day and night in various plays and sports. Now, moving aside from that numbers of hundreds and thousands, what we're seeing there, I would argue, is a genuine event from the British Iron Age. This is something that doesn't appear in classical sources, and irrespective of how this is transmitted down to the 12th century AD, whether it's oral tradition or whether it's in books or writings or things that don't no longer survive, what we're seeing here is something that the Britons enacted, they remembered, they recorded. Uh, so this is an event from a period of the Iron Age which we still mistakenly refer to as prehistory. <laughs> <laughs>